Dear friends of ancient Egypt, I'm greeting you from my workroom and little library in our house in Hützel, Germany, some 60 kilometers south of Hamburg. I would have liked better to speak to you via voce, but as you will perhaps know, a serious disease and operation prevented me from coming to California in person. Modern methods of communication, however, now enable me to speak to you via electronic devices. I would like to express my gratitude to the Northern and Southern California chapters of the American Research Center in Egypt for the invitation to present this lecture. I'm also grateful to those who have organized this lecture and made technically possible, Drs. Manu Saifzadeh and Marissa Stevens, as well as Barbara Wilcox, Lorraine Turk, Eva Kirsch, Nancy Corbin, and Glenn Meyer. Before starting the lecture about the Upper Egyptian Temple of Edfu, its architecture as an image of the world, I should say a few words about the Temple of Edfu and the study of its numerous inscriptions. This is covered in part A of this lecture. In part B, I will discuss the temple's architecture and how it is enhanced by the texts. In part C, I will show you how the temple imitates the world the Egyptians knew. In part D, I highlight how the artistry of the temple decoration complements the architecture. <clears throat> and finally, at the end, in part E, I will explain why the temple was built. Let me therefore begin now by giving you a general introduction to this miracle we call the Edfu Temple. People often associate the land of Egypt with its three famous pyramids, which were esteemed one of the seven wonders of the world. In Egypt, however, there are more buildings which deserve to be called a miracle. One of them is the Temple of Edfu, not only owing to its hieroglyphic inscriptions, but also owing to its architecture and decoration. The temple was erected in 237 BC and the building that lasted until 57 BC within a building period of 180 years. On the left side is a map of Egypt stretching out from the Mediterranean Sea in the north down to Abu Simbel near the contemporary frontier between Egypt and Sudan. On the right-hand side, above and below the rectangle, you find the modern towns of Luxor and Aswan. This part of Egypt is called Upper Egypt. Nearly halfway between Luxor and Aswan, at a distance of about 100 kilometers from each, we find the town of Edfu, situated on the west bank of the River Nile. Below, we have a ground plan and above a longitudinal section. We enter the temple from the south through the pylon, the monumental gate on the right side of the plan. We cross a large open court framed by colonnades and reach the proneus or four temple. Having passed by its 18 columns, we enter another pillared hall supported by 12 columns. Finally, we arrive at the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies marked A. Inside, there is a shrine. In antiquity, it accommodated the most important cult statue of Horus, who was the major god at Edfu. On our way to, its, to this interior, leaving the side rooms on the right and left on the side, we have just walked the main axis of symmetry that divides the, temples, the temple into two equal halves. The longitudinal section above shows that the pylon and the proneus are the highest parts of the building. The height of the other parts gradually diminishes from south to north. Moreover, from the ground plan inside the temple, we can discern that the width of the floor diminishes towards the interior and that at the same time, the floor gradually rises. This Design clearly shows the intention to focus attention on the Holy of Holies with its main cult statue of the God Horus. Before our eyes, we have the impressive southern facade of the pylon, the monumental entrance of the Edfu Temple. It is more than 35 meters high. This photograph taken from the northwest shows the western part of the girdle wall or enclosure wall, which surrounds the entire temple overtopped only by the pylon and the proneus or fore temple. 
The girdle wall, not including the pylon, is 137 meters long and 47 meters broad. This model illustrates the overall design of the northern half of the temple. We notice that several smaller chapels surround the Holy of Holies. There's also a narrow corridor formed by the outer walls of the temple building and the girdle wall. This is a view into the eastern part, into the eastern part of the corridor southwards. The girdle wall is to the left and to the right, the eastern wall of the Proneus. Between them, we can perceive the bottom of the corridor that extends southwards, linking up with the eastern colonnade, which on its part ends at the eastern tower of the pylon. The image shows an example of those thousands of hieroglyphic inscriptions which cover all the walls of the temple like a special kind of wallpaper. In the background, limited to the north, we see the facade of the Proneus, the four temple. The image below is taken from the top of the pylon. The of the columns in the interior of the Proneus, which support its roof. It is a view from the bottom up to the ceiling. On top of each capital, there's an abacus, a shallow square block of stone supporting the architrave, a long beam of stone holding the ceiling in its position. We can observe the differently carved capitals of the lotus columns in the, in the corners and in the middle, two palm tree capitals. The abaci or the ab abacuses are hidden above the large capital uh, they're hidden above the large capitals. Only a part of the architrave is visible. That gives the impression that the ceiling hovers above the ground, nearly unsupported, even more so in antiquity when the ceiling above the capitals was covered with yellow and stars and on a blue background. Off script, just a moment. I have to hide something here because it's in the way. Just a moment. Okay, on script. Uh, this is a lot. Nancy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt the talk. Nancy, could you turn off your video for a second? I have Nancy. Thank you. It was in the way of the script. Thank you so much. Sorry, so I'm back on script. This image allows our <clears> eyes <throat> to follow the main axis of symmetry from inside towards the Holy of Holies. At its end, we see the shrine inside of which the statue of Horus was kept in the shape of a falcon. Many gods and goddesses were worshipped in Edfu, but Horus was regarded as their king the first one of them all. This image is inside one of the smaller chapels that surround the Holy of Holies. Horus is on the right, his divine escort, the goddess Hathor on the left. She appears in human shape. He, as in most cases, has the body of a man with the head of a falcon crowned with the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. This picture shows a statue of Horus in the shape of a falcon on his head, the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, the top of the crown is broken. Horus extends holding the Ankh, and a hieroglyph symbol. He extends the Ankh towards the king's nose and mouth, thus giving the king the breath of life. The close intimacy between Horus and the king illustrates the ancient Egyptians' belief that the king was the son of Horus. Here we get an impression of the enormous quantity of hieroglyphic inscriptions as well as the large number of humans and animals. This is only one half of the shorter northern girdle wall showing its interior face. The wall has a height of 10 meters. The decorated walls of the temple have a length of about one kilometer. I surmise that now the question will arise how this mass of text and images was published 
and made accessible to the worldwide scientific community for scholarly studies. The temple had been excavated already in the 19th century. Many scholars copied shorter or longer passages of its inscriptions and translated them. A scientific translation, however, could not be achieved before two French Egyptologists tackled the task to make a copy of the entire body of text. Le Marquis de Rochemonté laid a solid basis and Emile Chassinat finished most of the work left by Rochemonté after his untimely death. The last volume of Chassinat's publication appeared in 1933. The entire publication compromised eight volumes of text, summing up to more than 3,000 large size pages and six volumes of line drawings and photographs. Chassinat no longer rendered the texts in any autographic edition as it was done before him, but created hieroglyphic fonts and published a typographic text edition without translation. An example thereof is reproduced on the right side of the picture. Nevertheless, some smaller passages of the inscriptions had been overlooked. In the line drawings and photographs, these were unfinished. It is also true that hundreds of mistakes that had crept into Chassinat's copy. For this, however, the great French scholar cannot be blamed since he had no scientific collaborators and modern equipment at his disposal. Based upon Chassinat's publication, many inscriptions and parts of the temple's decoration were studied in the following decades. A number of scholars published them in the form of many dispersed articles and books in various languages. Although many of these studies are extremely useful, it is obvious that a deeper insight into the whole could not be gained without translating all the inscriptions. In 1984, I established the Edfu work financially supported by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and by the Academy of the University of Göttingen, both of them in G G German institutions for the promotion of scientific research. This enabled me to pay collaborators as well as to buy the necessary equipment. There are volumes five, six, seven, and eight of the publication of the EDFU project, each of them containing a reproduction of the hieroglyphic text in a modern Egyptological transcription, a translation into, into the German language, a philological commentary, and a long list of the necessary corrections. As to the equipment, the image shows a tripod with a camera fixed on top that can be raised up to 15 meters. The pictures are displayed below on the screen of a computer. The main aim of the EDFU project is to acquire a reliable translation of all inscriptions based upon the dependable epigraphic basis, as well as studies of grammar, vocabulary, and the decoration system. A careful study of the decoration system is very important because most of the temple's decoration is a skillful combination of texts and pictorial representations. The epigraphic basis rests on 25,000 photographs, which allow us to scrutinize the copies, which were drawn from the original as hand copies. These books represent a part of the publication, namely the volumes six, sorry, five, six, seven, and eight. They contain the translation of the inscriptions that cover the pylon and the girdle wall, amounting to some 1,900 pages, comprising the phonetic transliteration, the translation itself in German language, and the philological commentary. The grammar contains a sign list of about 2,000 different signs used in Ptolemaic and Roman times that is from nearly 300 years before and until 300 years after Christ. Some of the hieroglyphs had 30 or even more word and sound values. The writing system is rather sophisticated and complicated. One of its many principles is called the Rebus Principle. Here's an example in English. Using Rebus, this beats iron. The first sign is an I. The second sign is the action run. As per rule in Egyptian writing, we can ignore all vowels. Therefore, run becomes ren. The three little balls at the end refer to metal and material. This is how you get the word iron. This example also shows that the number of hieroglyphs combined with this principle and others 
can lead the reader to many different readings. Nevertheless, this kind of writing is legible and understandable if you find and fold context logically. And if you were an Egyptian who is familiar with the many conventions of hieroglyphic writing developed by the scribes over the course of time. These scribes had developed a lot of conventions, some even based on this odd writing system. Another example, to be or not to be. That's the question. Part B, architecture. After this somewhat lengthy, but in my opinion, useful introduction, I shall now focus upon the architecture <clears throat> of the Temple of Edfu. I will show you how the Egyptian architects and high priests created the illusion that the Temple of Edfu was an image of the world. There cannot be any doubt about the intention to do this. This was already recognized by the early Egyptologists in the 19th century. To know how they staged this illusion, we had to study both the architecture and the relevant texts. Let me lead you through the temple, starting in the south with the pylon. And at other architectural elements of the building, I will show you the evidence that the temple of Edfu was conceived as an image of the world. In every case, I shall firstly look at the architectural and decorative evidence, and secondly, at the textual evidence. In general, we can discern only sometimes what the Egyptians felt or thought when they beheld the temple's sheer appearance. Here, for example, we see that the pylon with its mighty towers is the highest and the broadest architectural element of the temple, but we cannot immediately know merely by looking at the two towers immediately uh, that the two towers that the ancient egyptians thought of them as the mountains bahu and manu these mountains were considered to limit the east and the west of the world they were believed to be huge mountains which support the sky the two towers of the pylon are linked together by a bridge the bridge rests on the thick lintel of the main entrance I will return to this feature later on. The relevant original texts leave no doubt that the pylon was seen as the two mountains which support the sky. Before I turn to the text itself, we should bear in mind that there is always an irrefutable intellectual interconnection between an architectural element and the decoration carved into it or an inscription written on it. Later on, we shall see and hear more examples. Now. This scene is located on the eastern side of the eastern tower as the uppermost ritual scene. The king is presenting an offering to Horus, who appears as the sun god Horus Ray, as we can easily recognize by the sun disk on his head. The offering, partly destroyed but clearly distinguishable, consists of the hieroglyph for mountain with a sun disk between its two peaks. At the bottom of the disk, we can make out a beetle. The beetle is a hieroglyph that reads to become. It is also a symbol of the sun god Ray, who is just coming out of the Eastern horizon. The king, while giving this offering says to Horus, accept the mountain Bahu, which is before your face. May you light up it in it as a boy. When you open your eyes, the day breaks. When you close them, the darkness falls. The temples are opened at your appearance. Somewhat later, the king says, I have come to unto you in order to present you with the horizon and your manifestation, the sun disk, to make you appear in the sky as a youthful lad. On the western tower, in the exactly symmetrical location, the king is presenting nearly the same offering. There, we can still recognize the legs of a person standing upright within the sun disk, slightly bent forward. Parallels tell us that the person must be restored as the sun god in his shape of an old man who after his daily journey over the sky has grown old and is about to sink in the western horizon. Now the king says, accept the mountain Manu, which is before you, 
May you go down into it in the evening. Somewhat later, the king says, I have come unto you in order to present you with the horizon resting on my arms, in order to bring you the land of life, the West, in your shape as an old man, when you brighten the netherworld for those who dwell in the netherworld. The position of these two rich themes and the accompanying text make it clear beyond any doubt that the two towers were regarded as the, as the eastern and the western horizons. Be between the towers of the pylon, or in the Egyptians' eyes, between the mountains Bahu and Manu, the sky extends from the eastern to the western horizon. The space of this sky is occupied by the bridge, which was already mentioned above. The southern and northern outer faces of this bridge are decorated with a huge winged disc, an emblem of the sun god. This image shows the southern face of the bridge. The wings nearly reach the eastern and western ends of the decorated surface. The disc positioned right in the center is flanked by urea snakes who accompany and shelter the sun god. In this very shape, the sun god is imagined to cross the sky on his way from the eastern to the western horizon. In general, the lintel of every temple door is adorned with this emblem. Here, however, the emblem has an additional special meaning. This interpretation is even more convincing if we remember that sometimes, in other representations, the sky itself was displayed as a winged disc, whose wings are covered by the stars, thus representing the flying falcon itself as the sky. Having crossed the monumental gate of the pylon, we reach the great court surrounded by colonnades. The columns are shaped and decorated in a way that makes them appear as plants and trees. Most of the columns are designed as elaborated papyrus plants or palm trees. To the left at the bottom of the column, we see triangles with pointed tops inserted into one another. This is a photograph of the lower part of a natural papyrus plant. It shows the pointed thin leaves that cover the bottom of this plant. Here we see a photograph of an original Egyptian painting. On, the left, on its left side, bottom, we recognize a papyrus swamp showing the bottom leaves of the, the papyrus plant as well as the manner in which the Egyptians have changed the natural leaves into a mere pattern. A pattern, however, that makes unambiguously clear which plant is meant, a papyrus plant. This is a column of the great court with all its parts from bottom to top. On the top, just below the capital, we see the upper ends of several papyrus plants bundled up with five ties. This informs us that despite the decorated middle of the column, the papyrus column consists of a bundle of single papyrus plants. This architectural drawing shows more distinctly the details of a papyrus column, its carving as well as its decoration, and below the capital, the single stems tied together by five ribbons. This image clearly displays the construction of the roof from below, capital, abacus architrave, and ceiling. Unfortunately, the forms and colors of the yellow stars normally shining in a blue sky between the architraves are destroyed on the ceiling of Edfu. The same is true for the figures of the gods and other celestial beings dwelling in the sky. In the Proneus of the Temple of Dendera, however, similar to Edfu, the ceiling is completely preserved. The animal is the sign of Arius, the ram, belonging to the zodiac, surrounded by the stars. The image we have just before our eyes have shown the columns to be supports of the sky. This evidence is corroborated by many original inscriptions of the Temple of Edfu and also by the inscriptions of other temples. Three of them read, You find the temple being extremely lofty, equipped with columns, stretching out towards your majesty like papyrus. They are columns, gleaming like the sky, bright like the earth, not shaking, not getting tired, like the sky under the sun god ray. Ptolemy VIII, he erected for him, Horus, this monument, the temple, making his sanctuary magnificent like the firmament, 
Its columns are palm and papyrus with capitals, lotus flowers, combined with papyrus, engraved with metal tools, adorned with colors, a sight which resembles the sky. One question will surely come to mind now. What gave the ancient Egyptians the idea that plants and trees could support the sky? I surmise that they thought the air and the sky were one and the same matter, the air being nearer to the earth and thus carrying the sky. This is proven by many texts of Egyptian mythology dealing with Shu, the god of the air, and support of the sky. Here's an example. Shu, looking to the left, is standing under the goddess Nut. His arms are sir, uprised. The text on both sides of Shu's head read, Shu, who supports Nut, the goddess of the sky. In another text, more than 1,500 years older than the Edfu text, Shu himself states, I am Shu, the son of the god Atum. My garment is the air. Furthermore, in a text one, on one of the columns of the Proneus, the king is called the arm of Shu, who makes the far sky far for horror. That means that the king who built the temple is identified with the god Shu, and at the same time with the columns which support the temple's ceiling. In addition to this, I suppose there's also a visual aspect at the root of this idea. A person with a sense of poetry, his eyes moving slowly from above the real treetops into the sky, might get the impression that the treetops mingle with the air, touch the sky, and carry it. A strong argument in favor of the idea that the columns support the sky is the fact that in the ancient Egyptian language, the only word for capital is shena, used metaphorically because shena literally means the cloud. A look at these two rows of capitals in the Proneus may help to embrace this idea that capitals were meant to represent clouds. Let me now another architectural element of the temple. Under the roof of the Proneus and under the cornice, the main architrave of the Proneus stretches out as far as the facade resting upon six abacuses. The abacuses, or abachi, if you remember, are the flattened stone blocks on top of the six columns. Four of the capitals are papyrus plans. Between them, on the right and left, there is a palm column. In the center hovers the sun disk. With outstretched wings flanked by two urea snakes. The temple of Edfu is oriented towards due north. We, we are viewing here the facade of the Proneus looking southwards. Thus the main architrave stretches from east, uh, here that would be over here, east to, I'm sorry, east to west. The, the next, left. yeah. Right to, from right to left, yes. From east, sorry, from east to west. <laughs> the next <laughs> image permits a closer look at some of the figures on the surface of the main architrave. Below the cornice and in the middle of this image, we can see some details of the eastern end of the main architrave. Among many figures, there are six pairs, which are somewhat higher than the others. This section displays only the two eastern ones. We discern two women facing each other, holding upon their hands a sun disk, or alternatively, a winged beetle with a sun disk above, above it. The two women are Isis and her sister Nephthys. Isis, Nephthys. The, in, in Egyptian mythology, the role is to lift the sun into the sky every morning. The sun is their brother Osiris, who is about to leave the netherworld, having transfigured from a mummy into the morning sun. Thus, the ancient Egyptians tried to explain the phenomenon of the daily vanishing and reappearing of the sun, namely by a dyad, in other words, a twin deity that changes its form cyclically. The sun god grows old in the west in the evening, dies 
enters the netherworld, transforms himself into the god Osiris, crosses the netherworld, and resurrects as the morning sun. By the way, the icon of the two goddesses helps us to understand why in the complicated Ptolemaic writing system, the compound hieroglyph of Isis and Nephthys who uplift the sun disk reads Duau, the morning. The goddess Isis of the first element says, rise to the far sky, Horus, with a dappled plumage in your first form as the god Chepre, the morning sun. The goddess Nephthys on the first element says, get up high <clears> to the <throat> high sky, beetle who shines forth from the vulva of the sky goddess Nut. This architectural drawing is based below the right, the center of the entire decoration, that is the wind sun, and above and below on the left, the entire western half of the architrave and its decoration. Here we have the counterpart of the eastern half that is the western half of the architrave. On the western half of the architrave, we find again six compound elements being higher than the others. Each element consists of a god and a goddess holding up their uplifted arms, the hieroglyph with the meaning sky. The sun disk above the sky has turned its wings downward. indicating that the winged sun disk is about to sink. The accompanying legends inform us that the god's name is He. His wife's name is Hehet. This couple belongs to the primeval gods, which represent a part of that chaotic but fertile matter which existed before the god created the world. The god He of the first element says, sink down into the west mountain, rise again in the east mountain in the morning. The goddess Hehet of the first element says, go to rest in the land of life, the West, as manifestation of the beloved Osiris. Illuminate the land at the place of yesterday in the East. Now, there are six pairs of figures on the East side raising the morning sun and six groups on the West side carrying the sinking sun. They sum up to 12 groups, and so the interpretation is self evidence that 12 groups correspond to the 12 hours of the day. And so this long southern architrave of the Proneus represents the way of the sun on its daily celestial voyage from east to west. It makes the architrave and cornice of the Proneus appear as a sky, but of course, only if you can read and understand this kind of decoration. Now, all of you can too. What about the other beings apart <laughs> from the 12 groups just mentioned? They are helpers and supporters supporting the successful da daily journey of the sun. And at last, the central image of the winged disc represents the standstill of the sun at noon when it is at its zenith. The lowest part of the outer surface of the girdle wall right above the ground, also called the dado, is decorated with a rather stylized pattern <clears throat> of plants. The longest are papyrus, the smaller ones are lilies or lotuses and their buds. This is an architectural drawing showing a section of Tito on the eastern girdle wall. The stems of the plants flank a scene with Horus in the center, standing in a shrine, accompanied by a falcon and a vulture, each of them on top of a bush. This pattern covers the outer face of the dado of the entire enclosure wall, extending for something like two meters. The existence of these plants on the enclosure wall has a bearing on the theme of my lecture, too. In order to understand this, we must know that the first temple of Edfu was a bush of reeds in primeval times, which grew on the first island that emerged from the primeval ocean. The bush of reeds was the landing ground for Horus, who in the form of a falcon came down from the sky. This decoration on the outermost surface of the day before symbolizes the swamp around the shores of the first island on which the temple of Edfu was founded for the god Horus. Here now is a fascinating passage from the creation story written in the northwest aspect of the enclosure wall on its inner face high up in the third register. 
I'm now going to read for you the excerpt shown here, transliterated from the first seven columns of this passage, and then show you a few of the hieroglyphic details afterwards. As to the trampling and fighting of the two wideners, it is the moment of the sinking of the inundation. The two gods delimiting earth and water are brought. The beginning of the two integrators, one is called the far one, the other the great one. The moment of midday, the flood stood still. It is the instant of the visionary look of the one who is over the flood creating stems of reed, combined with the creative thought, producing the forceful looking horse sitting on it. When the reed is looked into existence, the far one is called. And when the reed grows on the place, the great one arrives. While there is one half land, the other half water. When the two accomplished ones, the far one and the great one arrive, the reed delimits a half given to each of them, who stabilize Jebar reed and Nabit reed in the middle of the flood. A flying power gets the reed and drives the matter, the hunger, away from him. To wit, the falcon on top of the reed. Secured are the Nebit reed and the Jebar reed, which support the falcon, Horus. Jeba and support of Horus come into existence as the names of this town, Etfu. I suppose you will agree with this interpretation when you listen to the original report of one of the hieroglyphic texts that is written on one of the walls of the temple of Etfu. We're going to go off script right now. Uh, here we have uh, a sample of the Ptolemaic hieroglyphic text, the creation story you just heard. Uh, Dr. Court has published a list of 14 derivation principles to help students of the language to decipher symbols they may not be familiar with. Here we would like to give you just a small sample of two of these principles. The first has to do with omitting, uh, and before I do that, let me just zoom in so that you can all see this. Let me see if that's possible. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so the, the first one has to do with omitting consonants no longer used in the orthography. Take a look in the leftmost column where it says cheper. Cheper. English come to be. The final R is no longer written because at this time it was no longer distinctly pronounced. The second example near the bottom of the third column shows several principles at once. The tusk tooth sign <clears throat> in Middle Egyptian, beh, stands for the consonant he only. So let me say this again. The tusk tooth sign usually is a biliteral beh, bh, beh, but here it only reads he, like h. The hand sign d is used instead of the bread loaf sign t to embellish the calligraphy of the three. Symbols stacked neatly on top of each other to spell the word heter for English above. This also shows the four consonants t, d, v, and j were being used interchangeably. If you have any questions about these derivation principles, you can ask Dr. Court after the lecture. On script, there can be no doubt that the reeds and the temple of Edfu are one and the same because the names of the town are written beside the outer stems of the reed. Utset Her, that's over here, on the right, and Jeba on the left side. Both meaning town. On the right side, we see the eastern section. On the right side, we see the eastern section of the surrounding wall. And on the left side, three of the eight water spouts <clears> protruding <throat> from the eastern wall of the temple in fabric. The water spouts are fully functional. 
By means of an intelligent system of water conduits, the rainwater is conducted from the roof to the water spouting lions. From between <laughs> their claws is drained to the bottom of the corridor that surrounds the temple between its outer wall and the girdle wall. Below the line on the left side of its base, you may notice a long hieroglyphic inscription. Hieroglyphic inscriptions surround the water spouts on its four sides. Remember it because I shall later come back to these inscriptions and their astonishing content. The rainwater is finally led, led through the girdle wall between the plants on the dale. Out of the temple to the soil and from there back to the primeval ocean where the rainwater, as it was thought by the Egyptians, originally came from. Now, in order to show you that even the water spouts played a role in the making of the Temple of Edfu into an image of the world, I will briefly make a, side, a step aside to ancient Egyptian mythology once again and then quote some of the texts on and near the water spouts. The god Seth had murdered his brother Osiris. Osiris' son Horus assumed the moral obligation to take revenge on Seth. Seth was a wild and strong god. He caused confusion and troubles of every kind. He created disorder, and it was the other god's duty to remove the damage caused by Seth. Thus, among other things, it was a trait of Seth's character to cause thunderstorm and heavy rain. Normally in Ptolemaic times, rain was not uncommon in the delta, and there it added to the fertility of the fields. In Upper Egypt, however, the rain, the rare thunderstorms were devastating, and the torrential rains caused a lot of damage. A heavy rain caused by Seth, with water rushing into the interior of the temple, would do a lot of damage to the statues, the hieroglyphs, and their colors, the temple equipment, and so on. Therefore, in, re in the realm of reality, the water spout's function was to protect the temple against damage caused by heavy rainfall. In the realm of mythology, however, the water spouts were embodiments and manifestations of Horus. In some texts, they were also embodiments of his children. Now, their role was to defend the temple against the celestial disorder that threatened the temple as an image of the world. In this regard, the texts on the water spouts do not leave a shadow of a doubt. Here we have a description on the base of a water spout lion. Below, we see two figures of the Nile god Happy bringing offerings. This should not <clears throat> astonish us, since you will remember the rain in the ancient Egyptian imagination fell down from the celestial Nile, a counterpart of the terrestrial river Nile in the sky. The priest, poet, and composer of the text had carefully chosen words beginning with or containing the sound che which at the same time fitted the contents of the text. Such a creative use of the language, as well as similar word plays or puns, would obviously delight the Egyptian priests very much, and the believers of the Egyptian religion too. We can safely deduce this from the great number of examples. I'm off script. Uh, Dr. Court will now recite the original text so that you can appreciate how the sound of the words written on the side of the base would have imitated the sound of the water spouting line above. Now, I hope you can understand me because my voice has turned after the operation somewhat hoarse. But nevertheless, I will try. Cheti chema'a, henet shen er chebet, hebenti her chenep, kesuchen, em chet, chemu chachas en em chach erit, hetinen. It sounds and, as if the lion were spitting and roaring. And so in English, what this means, uh, since I know that most of you understand it, but I didn't, so I'm going to read it in English for myself. It says, retreat from the shrine of the child Horus. You ill-natured recede. You blind one, Seth. Mount the scaffold. The criminal Seth is thrown down. Your bones are destroyed by fire, and the ashes thereof are rapidly blown away to the sky. O ye enemies of the first of the horizon horrors. Here, text is two. And what we've done is we just added the transliteration again. I'm going to 
magnified is for the Egyptologists in the audience, just so, so you get a feel. And again, if you are, you can ask questions about this later if you like. Um, but just to give you a feel for the Ptolemaic hieroglyphic writing and uh, how Dr. Kurt uh, transliterated it. And this is the text that he just read for you uh, in its original yeah. sound. Yes, that's right. On script, another water spout line says, I am the one with the strong claws who watches over the throne, Edfu, protecting the seat of my father Horus from damage. I guard the house of Ray, the sun god Horus, against every kind of harm during the night of the thunderstorm. I give shelter all around Mesen, Edfu, on the day when the clouds of thunder are in the sky. I preserve those in it, the temple, when the flood of rain has come, draining it quickly outwards. I am this manifestation of the strong one on the roof who keeps the evil away from my father Behedeti, Horus. Part C, imitating the world. The foregoing examples reveal a general rule of the temple's decoration. The decoration of the temple tries to imitate the real position of things in our world. Themes belonging to the earth were located near the ground. Themes belonging to the sky are sited near the ceiling and themes belonging to the air are placed in between. For the latter, I shall give the following example. The king has appeared before the sun goat Horus Ray, uplifting the hieroglyph of the sky under the winged disc, which emits beams of sunlight. The symbolic value of this <laughs> ritual scene is to show that here in Edfu, the king has erected for Horus a terrestrial home, which corresponds with the and cosmic dimension of Horus, the Lord of Fire. With respect to the to idea, the legends of the scene are unambiguous. The king appears in the attitude and function of Shu, the god of the air. It will not surprise you to hear that nearly all 24 scenes of this kind are located right in the middle registered decoration, corresponding with the position of the air between earth and sky. Part D, the artistry. I should not forget to point out that all the walls, ceilings, and columns of an Egyptian temple were originally many colored, shining in deep and bright colors. Although the colors were not always naturalistic, they added to the general impression that the Temple of Edfu was meant to be a lively and vivid image of the world. Most of the colors are completely gone or blurred due to the impact of sandstorms and excrements of bats and birds. On some sheltered spots, however, the colors have survived. On the ceiling of a staircase in the Temple of Edfu, we can still today see the paintings of the flying vultures and their accompanying inscriptions in a rather good state of preservation, still showing most of their colors. The colors on some of the capitals are well preserved. This is the capital of the northwestern column of the Proneus. This picture of the famous Scottish painter David Roberts dates back to the year 1838. It represents a view of the pillared hall of the Temple of Phila, contemporary with the Temple of Edfu. In Roberts' times, the temple was not annually flooded by the impact of the modern Nile Dam, and many of the colors were still visible. Beside the right capital, we can even see the yellow stars in the blue field. This picture can further our fantasy to imagine how the interior of a temple looked like in antiquity when it was totally colored. David Roberts' rendering, as shown above, is confirmed by the preserved colors of the temple of Edfu. Part E, why built a temple? There's a mutual relationship between the temple and the sky. If believers decided not to worship their God in a cave, in a grotto, or in bare nature, but to build for him an earthly dwelling place. They necessarily had to use walls and columns to create for the God a room to live in. This had to be a room, however, 
that mirrored the dignity and almightiness of the God. On the other hand, a world temple of this kind could help to understand and form an idea of the physical world, which in antiquity was, of course, still incomprehensible. This made the Egyptians think, for instance, that the sky was supported by huge pillars at the edge of the horizon and that the sky had doors and windows. The ancient Egyptians conceived, as we have seen, the temple of Edfu as an image of the whole world. From a certain point of view, this is still valid today. The graffito tells us that even the Canadian traveler, Mr. W.M. Jones from Ottawa, belonged to the world of Edfu as a guest for a short while. Here you can watch the hardworking director of the project in the heat of the Upper Egyptian midday in full action. <laughs> And uh, third parties contributed images 18 to 20, 24 to 27, 29 and 36. And these are used here with their permission. A map shown of Germany is by Google Earth and all other images shown are courtesy of Dr. Dieter Kurth and the Edfu Project photo collection. And I want to thank you so much for listening and we'll open it up now for <laughs> questions. No, not yet. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Manu, for reading this text. And I think it's not th that easy to read it for such a long time. I hope you can understand my hoarse voice a little bit. And uh, you helped to uh, understand my text better uh, because you mended some of my Awkward school English expressions, <laughs> I fear. Thank you very much. My, my, my horse is also a horse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, so as a reminder, um, please type your questions to our 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 speaker, our our, our esteemed guest, Professor Kurth, uh, into yeah. the Q and A box. Yeah. You can find that box by opening. Uh, your <clears throat> window that says Q and A, you'll find that either at the top or bottom of your Zoom screen. In there, Christina, yes, she said amazing photos. Thank you so much, um, and and I can echo that as well. It was a beautifully put together presentation. So, while I'm waiting uh, for some questions to to pop into. Um, the Q and A box. I have one myself. If if I could, if I could take the liberty, um, I you showed at the beginning of the presentation um, some of the tripods on uh, with cameras and tripods and the camera setup. Yeah. Have you used any other more specialized equipment for this project? Um, and if so, what what other types of maybe specialized camera equipment or lighting systems have you used? Um. This question can be answered easily. We used our computers, of course, and all the books uh, we took to Egypt from Germany. And we also used a telescope, uh, which magnified 60 times. Because oh. the tops of the pylon, the descriptions on the tops are in a height of 35 meters, but from the bottom, with the help of this telescope, we could clearly read these inscriptions. These are most of the, uh, uh, ah, not all, because the Egyptians themselves had begun, had started to mount uh, scaffolds in order to fill the gaps in the wall, in order to prevent the sparrows to nest there and to spoil the walls with their excrements. And sometimes they allowed us to use their scaffold to come closer to the wall in order to uh, copy the hieroglyphs better and more correctly. Possible to make hand copies from photos that are taken at an angle because how you said you would use like the telescopic lenses that would place your photo at a slight angle. Is it possible to render a copy from photos yes. like that? Uh, it is not a good copy. You are right. 
but uh, our help is the sense of the inscriptions. Right. It helps a lot. And there is another enemy of us. It is the sun. Mm. The sun that is moving. In the morning at 8, you see a bird like a uh, falcon. Two hours later, you see it as another bird. But uh, the only thing that helps us is to use uh, the sense of the inscriptions. So I'll turn to the Q&A box now. Um, Linda Myers asks, are the notes of your lecture available for download? Well, we can do one better. Um, the video will be posted. Uh, so you can you can take a look uh, for emails from both chapters with information about how to watch the video if you'd like to do that. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll jump to um, John Lindwall. Uh, he asks uh, the pylon that represents the two mountains. Yes. Do the mountains also hold up the sky? Are the yes. mountains the eastern and western, or do they have astronomical parallels? No, um, there are no astronomical parallels. They uh, believed that those two mountains, Bajo and Manu, uh, carried the mountains on their tops, on their peaks. It was what they believed. But it was a belief that dates back to very, very ancient times. And in the course of time, it was uh, just transmitted. And uh, I do not personally do not think that they still believed it in Ptolemaic times because the sight of the world had changed. They knew far, far, uh, far countries, Ptolemaic ships sailed to India in these days. So the sight of the world in their minds had changed. But nevertheless, they transmitted all the old uh, concepts and ideas into these far later times. Um, Hedvig Georg, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize if I'm not, um, asks if those two types of reeds that you mentioned, yes, are yes. they also mentioned elsewhere? And if so, what contexts? Yes, they're uh, mentioned elsewhere as a normal vocabulary. They belong to Egyptian language, and uh, but the idea that the god Horus, uh, with his creative look, made them come out of the primeval ocean. This is genuine Edfu. Uh, idea. You will not find it in whole Egypt, especially for Edfu. There are other cultural centers and religious centers in Egypt which have ideas of their own, which uh, often differ from them, what I told you. Along with that, another question about the potential uniqueness of Edfu. We have an anonymous attendee who says, um, that you mentioned the architecture and theme of Edfu was a representation of the world. Is that unique to Edfu temple, or do we so see similar themes with other Ptolemaic temples? Yes, that's true what you said. You uh, can see uh, several scenes, similar similar scenes, in other Ptolemaic temples, for instance, in Philae and Dandara and Komombo and so on, the other big Ptolemaic temples, you find similar scenes, and they have a similar meaning, of course. Um, so uh, Lorraine Turk has a question that didn't make it mm. into the Q&A box yes. because yes. Uh, panelists cannot type in there. So Lorraine, you're okay. right. Um, okay. But Professor Kurt, uh, did you start your research with the expectation that the temple was an image of the world, or did that develop over time? Oh, yes. Uh, in Egyptology, this was known for ages. I think from the middle of the 19th century onwards, the early Egyptologists had recognized that. They told it uh, by the stars, the ceiling, and by the columns. But all the different uh, things I told you, they could not know you need to read texts. And this could not happen before I started with the project uh, translation of the whole. 
Um, we have Sid Kitchell, who mm -hmm. asks, is the Ptolemaic temple that we see today built on top of an older one? Yes, it is. It had uh, a lot of forerunners, <clears throat> and they date back to the uh, the early century, I think, to the uh, to to the um, first half of the second uh, millia, millennium before Christ, and then in a long row down to the Ptolemaic area. And the most uh, <clears throat> preserved, best preserved is the temple of Ramses III, which is quite near the temple of Edfu, uh, temple of Ramses III, yes. That's right. And there's a whole town near Edfu, and the, the, uh, the parts of architecture, the elements of architecture found in the rubbish of this town tells us a lot about the forerunners of the Ptolemaic temple, too. <clears throat> Can you understand my hoarse voice? Oh, yes, yes. But please do let me know <clears throat> if if we need to end the q and I don't want no, to no. overtax you. No, no, okay. I, I can do I can go on. Okay, yeah. Um, so next we, we have Richard Tuttle. Uh, he noticed in a number of the photos that a lot of the details of the people or deities appear to be very pitted, um, you know, almost as if they are scraped out, but the hieroglyphs appear not to be uh, to that extent. Um, is there a significance to that at all? Any maybe intentional damage to the images? Yes, they are intentional because the temple uh, had served in the course of the century for several um, aims, for several uh, purposes. So it was a fortress. And it was on its top that we could see a village consisting of 64 houses on top of it, a mud brick houses. And <clears throat> there were also the Christians, which had... Uh, now lived in this temple and uh, all these uh, things of the the remains of the ancient Egyptians were made by heathens, 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 uh, how do you, heathens, heathens, yeah, heathens, yes, made by heathens mm -hmm. and they tried to uh, destroy the pictures <clears throat> and there, there was a, a, a sort of um, Aberglauben, a sort of what is super, super superstition. Superstition, yes, I forgot the word. And there was a sort of superstition, and they were afraid of if they did harms to the pictures, they could uh, throw at them the bad look, the bad eye. And they dis mostly destroyed the feet and the legs to prevent them from following them to take revenge. That's a uh, part of uh, superstitious. <laughs> superstitious belief. <clears throat> um, our next question comes from Robert Nayland. Um, he says he, he saw the drawing of Newt early on in the presentation, um, was also accompanied by the symbol for Heka magic in the upper left. Was Heka still part of the cosmology at the time of the construction of Edfu Temple? Um, a little bit, not much. They, of course, knew this goddess. Uh, uh, Heka uh, often appears in the inscriptions, but it uh, is not entangled with the construction of the temple. In other contexts, Heka uh, appears, yes, of course. But it's not. he was not uh, engaged in building the temple. There were other persons, for instance, the god Thoth, the god of wisdom, who knew how to construct it, and uh, also the, the goddess Seshat, she was the goddess of writing. She knew how to um, to to, uh, to to draw the ground plan of the temple and so on, but not Heka. Other gods. John Lindvall uh, mentions, yeah. you know, the gate, the walls, the courtyard, the pillars, they all represented yeah. parts of the created creative wor created world. world yeah. um, 
<clears throat> what did the Holy of Holies represent, if anything? The the Naos. Uh, the Holy of the Holies is sometimes called the nest of Horus, mm -hmm. the innermost part of the temple where he lives and where his main uh, cult statue was preserved. This is uh, the Holy of the Holies. Yes, that's right. And uh, it, the Holy of the Holies uh, hosted not only the statue, the main statue of Horus, but also his bark, his processional bark. Uh, on festival days, uh, the priests uh, put his statue, a special statue on the ship, put the ship on their sh shoulders and carry it out of the temples. And uh, people standing at the, the sides of the street and uh, feeling very happy about the God himself showing to them. I'll jump to a question that maybe relates to that um, slightly. Um, so Mage Magu mentions, um, or will ask, is there a connection between the scenes of Horus's victory um, and the winter solstice as a phenomenon, or is there anything having to do with the placement of certain scenes and the alignment of the temple, maybe with astronomical events that occur? Good question. It, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it can, uh, I can answer it uh, definitively, but it's not... Uh, quickly done. You mm -hmm. see, uh, if you remember the western girdle wall, its interior face is covered by a long row of special scenes, and in these special scenes, um, it's shown how the god Horus uh, comes to the south in order to help his father Ra, because the the other gods and uh, mankind had made a revolution against Ra in the south. And we all know that the sun god in the south is weak. And so a uh, rebellion had occurred, occurred in the south. And Horus himself now goes down to the south in order to help his father. And then the... Uh, there is a long row of scenes which follow each other in a line from south to north. And there are several uh, battlefields mentioned. In those battlefields, Horus himself killed the enemies of his father Ra. Until he arrives at the Mediterranean Sea, and then Thoth, the god of wisdom, asks, have we uh, trans... Um, have we passed through whole of the land, Egypt? And his head, he answers, yes, we have. And then Horus returns to the south again and the same procedure as every year <laughs> happens. Um, and, uh, that's so true. Our... The, the solstices uh, play a big role in the temple of, a, a great role, not a big role, a great role in the temple of Edfu, yes, it is. We have an anonymous attendee asking if there were any buildings that represented the world before the Ptolemaic period, or was this really a Ptolemaic development, as you see? No, it, it uh, started earlier, mm -hmm. but it was elaborated in this way, I told you, only in Ptolemaic times. It starts earlier, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, but uh, it, in those times, in, in those remote times, it was not as ele elaborate, elaborated than later. I told you uh, the the uh, knowledge of the world had changed because of time, and mm -hmm. the Ptolemies in the times of Ptolemies, and more was known about the real uh, extens extension of the world, how big it was, how large it was. Elizabeth Butz asks, in the inner chambers, like the so-called library that you mentioned, um, have you found any special inscriptions? In the library? Yes, of course. In the library, uh, the names, 
of all the books were written on the walls, all the books that the former times were kept there in this little library. Mm -hmm. We know all the titles. There, for instance, there is a title, uh, To Know the Wandering of the Stars, or another book, How to Kill Seth, How mm -hmm. to Kill the Crocodile, the Hippopotamus, and uh, all other fine enemies, or the, the, the um, bulls, all the other animals of uh, horse, because the enemies, horse enemies, appeared in uh, various uh, forms of animals. And then lastly, we have Sarah Cedic, um who asks, does the Holy of Holies, going back to potential representations, could it represent to a what, mound what? of creation? The, the Holy of Holies or the Naos? Yes. Yes. Could it represent a mound of creation or the Ben Ben? You you already mentioned that it it represented, let's say, in terms of mythology. But does it have any creative properties in terms of of representing that mound of creation or the Ben Ben? Uh, not the uh, holy of the holy is called A at the ground plan. If you remember, behind it there's another sanctuary that's called Messen. And this is the nucleus of the temple, not the sanctuary. And this uh, place called Messen is a place where Horus killed his main enemy, said in form of crocodiles and hippopotamuses. Mm -hmm. This is the most important uh, sanctuary. It's just behind the, uh, we we have not seen it. We could we can only see it on the ground plan named I with the letter I. Mm -hmm. 